it's time to make our first character of the week. This is, uh, you know, back at the frontier of Mesotopia. We're going to be second to the PHB races, and let's find out where this is going to go. You know, uh, Bubonic, you're saying no bard. I don't think we've had a dwarf character in quite some time, speaking of three dwarves in our uh, one word at a time story. Uh, Perot the Keep, uh, Tomb, Underdark, or Epic. One of those three, if you clear that, then uh, you'll get double EXP for that dungeon, and roleplay-wise, you'll get a keep in that location. <clears throat> a Dwarf Bard would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> Dwarves are what's up, says Gidlock. Let's find out, huh? Okay. We're going to roll a percentile die to find out if we have a male or a female, 1 to 45, male, 46 to 90, or a multi-class character, 91 to 100. 36, we're starting off with a female character. Now we will figure out with a D10, and we'll re-roll the 10, which race we're looking at. <clears throat> oh, Volvo. There's a bonus, by the way. There's a bounty if you can, uh, if you can overcome the devil that's now haunting you from that deck pull. Uh, I rolled a 10, so that's a re-roll. 7, that is a half-elf. Let's re-roll this one more time and figure out if she favors her human side or her elven side a little bit more. 3 is odds, favors human. Now, that's nothing official in the player's handbook or really in any other supplement. Though, it's a way for us to determine, I don't know, if we were on the fence maybe about her looks or her personality. So it could be genetics and how, you know, maybe her ears are a little shorter or a little rounder. Uh, maybe her eyes just aren't as almond shaped. Um, or something along those lines. She is favoring her human portion more than her elven portion. <clears throat> uh oh, Norton is uh, Norton is swapping alignments. I'll let you work that out. I, I don't know what you're. We have a lawful good null, says Bubonic one. <laughs> All right, now let's figure out. Speaking of alignments, let's roll two d one hundreds and find out her alignment. Eighteen and thirty-five. That is neutral good. And the way we are a medium creature, we're going to put that right here. Okay. Now for her level. That's going to be 1d100. Hit roll. We rolled a 12, and a 12 is level 5. She has the ability to take one stat bump at level 4 or a feat. I'm going to roll a percentile again and find out if we're going for the feat or we're going for a stat bump. 86, she is going to take a feat instead of a stat bump. Although remember, some some feats will still give you an ability score improvement, just not a full one. All right, so we've added that. Now I'm gonna manufacture a 13-sided die down here, and I'm gonna hit roll, and we're gonna find out what her background is. Eight, she is a noble or a knight. Now, nobles or knights don't have any kind of origin, so we'll just choose which one is going to sound best for whatever she ends up becoming. That means, though, she's going to also get to choose either position of privilege or retainers. What do those mean? Eh, we'll get to it in just a little bit here. Just know that she has some options for her background. And now we come to... Our class. 
Bubonic one doesn't want this golden button to give us a two. Otherwise, that's a bard. <laughs> Uh, also, uh, Dark Wolf, if you can help Volvo, he pulled flames, so he uh, he needs to he needs to kill a devil to get uh, double exp. And then Norton gives the lunchbox back to the Awu and says, "No problem, I'm here to help." Yeah, so what what a reversal of fortune, right? <laughs> Dark Wolf is evil, and Norton is is or oh, Norton's a good boy. <laughs> Norton is best boy. <laughs> All right, let's hit this golden button here and uh, and continue on. Three. We dodged that bullet, eh? Uh, we have a cleric of some kind. And specifically, when we look down here, clerics have seven different kinds of, uh, of non-evil uh, domains. So let's make a seven-sided die, or we'll just roll a d8 and re-roll an eight. One. Okay, so this means we are a knowledge cleric. There we go. Uh, flame. No, uh, death is that. I think. I think the devil uh, lives in uh, Underdark. If I'm remembering correctly, Dark Wolf. Right, because he's he's the devil's in hell. You're under and whatever. Super colliders, hey, how's everyone this fine morning, afternoon, night, depending where you are? Doing very well, Super. Thank you. I'm feeling a lot better from Friday and the weekend. Uh, besides, maybe fighting like a really low low level cold, and uh, things are getting back on track. And we have a brand new week ahead of us. It's good stuff. Volvo going into the Underdark, hoping to get EXP off of this Lolf Priestess and to kill the devil that's down there. Oh my goodness. You attack with advantage. Well, unfortunately, Volvo, your advantage. Yeah. <laughs> ouch. Nope. And ouch. <laughs> I, I, I think a lot of the chat just kind of went... <laughs> oh, uh, are we watching fireworks now? Is Volvo a beautiful fireworks display? Shall we shall we remove our hats and gaze longingly up at the sky at our friend Volvo who won't come back out from that place? <laughs> hey, nice combo. There you go. Male half work paladin Volvo. Res, please. Okay, we have our half elf knowledge cleric. Yes, you did. You did, Volvo. Half elves here start at four feet nine inches. And we're going to add 2d8 inches to that height. We're going to add six. All right. So we have a five foot. Uh, oh, I'm, I was looking at the wrong entry here. It's going to be almost the same thing. Uh, five foot, three inches. We're going to take that same six, multiply it by 2d4 to get his weight. All right, so six times three is 18. And if you see, we come over here and we add 18 to this base weight. He's 128 pounds, or she is 128 pounds. Her age range, we're going to roll on a percentile on a distribution curve and find out. 49 is going to put her in adult. She is an adult. So here's column three. This is a, These are the adult ages of the standard races. And let's look at the row for half elf. She's between 56 and 90 years old. So that is a 35-sided die. 27. Okay. So that's going to be uh, 76. She's going to be 82. There we go. 
some quick mental math. If I was a derp and didn't do it correctly, please, uh, please let me know. All right, while we're on this page, while there's no special origin to being a noble or a knight, she is still going to get 2d8, well, two, uh, two personality options of eight. We're getting number eight and number seven. And then 3d6 will determine... Um, oh, got a YouTube comment. One, three three and six for the ideal bond and flaw. All right, that will take care of the random rolls. We can tuck this away for now. And conveniently, look at this, we have chapter four of the PHB open. Ivlon, that's true. I suppose I could, I could entertain that uh, simultaneously. Is even a broken clock is wrong twice a day, or is correct? Is wrong twice a day? Ah, well, I guess that answers that, Evlon. Even a broken clock is correct twice a day. Norton's going hunting in the plains. Stop on a nine. And well, hey, that's enough. You got the warg, Norton. Super colliders with the addition of the uh, with the addition of the Gith and Durgar now, I request those races be added to the Res Please command. Well, if there's if we're really looking at it, oh gosh, <clears throat> there's the Aracokra, Asimar, Bugbear, Dragonborn, three different dwarves. Uh, Six elves, Furbolgs, uh, four Genasis, two Gith, three gnomes, Goblin, Goliath, half elk, half elf, half orc, two halflings, Hobgoblin, human, Kenku, Kobold, lizard folk, orc, Tabaxi, and uh, now there are nine tieflings, a Triton, and a Yanti uh, pureblood. Although honestly, this list is uh is missing the uh the turtle folk or the the uh the turtle people that are found i think in elemental evil so things to look after there's also uh different kinds of um I mean, we look at backgrounds, there's definitely more than 13 of those. We could play a little bit, by the way, with uh, the Sword Coast Adventures guide at some point in time. Uh, can bring that up and do some other options, play around with that book. We could play around with uh, Xanathar's Guide to Everything for some different uh, archetypes. So yeah, we'll, we'll, splash, uh, we'll splash other D&D content. You love the idea of the gift so that they have a special place. What about the gift uh, particularly, you know, get you thinking or get you motivated? Uh, what what about them is really, yeah, gif. Hi, King. Uh-oh, Peru attacks with disadvantage. <clears throat> Salutations to you, King. Three and six. Ooh, yeah, that is not going to be enough to take care of that uh, illithid. Uh, so Peru gets his brains eaten. Oh, well. What's your shirt today, Mola? An 8-bit uh, next generation crew. Hmm. <laughs> 
Uh, behind me, I actually have a, um, a prop replica of the crystal that Picard kept on his desk. So, I, I enjoy that franchise. Oathbreaker. Ninety six. Well, that's that's Claire Death Domain. I guess technically Oathbreakers on ninety seven. Oh yeah, King, so Norton pulled the uh Norton pulled the alignment swap uh, card from the deck of many things. Uh, so Norton is being a good boy right now. Uh, he's no longer chaotic evil or the like. He actually, in fact, uh, returned the lunchbox that he stole from Dark Wolf. And Dark Wolf, by the way, is, is chaotic evil still. So, I mean, we're having... You've ascended from Lich... from Lichdom, or Lichhood. I don't know how you want to... how you want me to, to go about that. And, uh, and now we have a chaotic evil, a woo, and a lawful good knoll. So this is quite the thing. Zerby, hello! Welcome back, Zerby. Yeah, under dark is squishing everyone. Uh, dark Wolf, baddest talisman. Thank you very much for the follow. -ho. Thank you. Uh, getting back to this, uh, I'm, I'm still. Oh, no, then also I hear, hear you're good now. Would you perhaps consider yourself to be 100% true good? <laughs> He's still handing out the pamphlets, but let's be fair. He paid for them to be printed out, so he might as well use them. Now I begin with the background. Because this is what you did before you were an adventurer. You know, you, you were born into this, or this was... This is what trained you to become an adventurer in some way. Here's Noble. Now remember, as we develop her personality, we can choose. Do we want her to be noble, or do we want her to be a knight? Kind of the same thing, but different. As well, we can choose. Do we want her to have the position of privilege that being a noble brings, uh, or a retainer? <laughs> You're truly an upstanding member of society. Glad to have you on board and do very, very good things. Uh, Drake, what do you need caught up on? Uh, the roleplay going on in chat or what you're seeing on the screen? Ivlon says, good is just Doog spelled backwards. <laughs> and evil is live. Both, okay. Well, uh, so, Drake, you have two kind of roleplay factions. I don't know, King King is part of the True Good family, um, who was a lich who was kind of going around and, and doing evil, evil things. Um, but having a bit of a quandary, understanding the mortal world, and of course constantly warring with his wife... Um, and then you have the Awu clan, who is kind of joined in with the True Good family, because Dark Wolf is their lawyer, but she has her own group going on, and uh, they live in a place called Kitty Pendia, you know the the Kitty Pen. So while while King and everyone are like warring with each other and slaughtering you know armies by the thousands, uh, they're just sort of hanging out in the Kitty Pen, drinking juice boxes and coloring. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, and then we've had some allegiance shifts, and we've had some other uh, some other quasi factions pop up here and there too. So that's the that's the gist. Norton's kind of a free agent, although he's had a bit of a change of heart. He uh, drew from the deck of many things and swapped his alignment. Because uh, look, that can happen. As for what's happening up on the screen, we are making random character number one for the week, who is a female half elf who favors her human side. Um, in some way, mentally, uh, bi biologically, something like that, who is a cleric of the knowledge domain, and we are just now delving into her background to solidify that and get a sense of her personality 
before we go and uh, generate any other aspects to her character. Because your background determines, you know, it's, it's who you were before you are an adventurer. How did you get your training that helped you swing a sword, or negotiate, or do things like that? Ivlon, because I am Doog. <laughs> Uh, Drake, if you want to join in, just have fun. If you type in a forward slash M-E space whatever, your words will, will show up colored the same as your name in chat. And that generally indicates that you're role playing or that you're doing other things. So if you want to join with one of the factions that are here, you want to start your own, maybe you want to try and be friends with Norton the Knoll because he's kind of an independent. He's sort of like a a rogue agent right now um you can you can do so just have fun with it drake jump in create whatever you want you don't need uh you don't need a rhyme or reason or a dice roll norton still got his uh his spear tipped with magical stones that have been uh sharpened and made pointy <laughs> all right so as a noble look all the backgrounds do have a good amount of fluff things to get you thinking about the character more i suggest you read them if you haven't they're very w well worth doing so for time and purposes of how we're broadcasting i'm not going to do that because we're going to talk about the character herself as a specific character and not as a broad concept of a noble Drake glances around at the occupants, shaking his head. Such children. Then he conjures a glass of iced tea to drink. <laughs> All right, we're going to get uh, some skill proficiencies in history and persuasion. Noted. We're going to get a tool proficiency in some kind of a gaming set. We will also get a language of our choice. So being a half-elf, we get common, elven, one other, and now we're going to get one other on top of that. Equipment. We will receive a set of fine clothes. A signet ring. A scroll of pedigree. And a, a purse containing 25 gold. It, it is good to be the king. Now, we have two different options. Um, we have two different options. Oh, you okay, Zerby? For her background feature. Position of privilege will let her get around in... Um, oops, straight here. Will uh, let her get around in, in higher circles, you know, rubbing elbows with people. Um, that might open up, uh, favors that could, uh, lead to, you know, patrons giving the, her slash the party, uh, gifts of information, transportation, that kind of a thing. Or there is a variant down here, which I think can work with regular nobles and not just knights, but you can take, uh, retainers instead, wherein you have three NPCs who are following you around. In this case, if you went noble, I would say they're, you know, like a valet, a, um, you know, maybe like some sort of like a handmaiden or something, another, some other kind of an attendant, like a translator, maybe. Uh, you then, uh, or if you went with a knight and you took position of privilege, well, it's just that. You're just noted for your deeds, and even though you're more of the military type, you can get into places because you're recognized, or if you take knightly retainers, then instead of getting three non-combatants, uh, you'll get uh, three NPCs, but one of them would be your squire, who may be able to fight. I mean, I don't know if you'd want that squire on the front line, because he or she may not last too long. Uh, and then someone like maybe um, a, a saddle, like a saddle polisher, 
and someone who keeps your arms and armor uh, shiny and going. Oh, a water savant sorcerer. <laughs> well, squires, squires are training for fighting. You know, instead of just having, you know, two maids and a butler, I mean, we'll, we'll go back to your running maid RPG earlier, Evalon. So instead of having two maids and a butler, you at least have, like, a bodyguard and a maid and a butler. So you have someone who is, you know, not like a front lines, uh, you know, a storied uh, general, you know, commander or anything. But you have someone who can at least possibly fight uh, and is competent with, uh, you know, has knowledge of arms and armor. Raven, welcome, and thank you very much for the host. <laughs> you take me as some conjurer of, of cheap drinks? <laughs> yeah, Tycho's fluttering around as a pixie right now. That's how it goes. All right, let's look at her personality traits. Eight and seven. If you do me an injury, I will crush you, ruin your name, and salt your fields. Ooh. And number seven, my favor once lost is lost forever. Oh, so she's she's a little bit uppity. Her ideal is number one, respect. Respect is due to me because of my position, but all people, regardless of station, deserve to be treated with dignity. So respect does, it should flow up, uphill to her, though she does see those who are beneath her and, you know, she should treat them with dignity, even if they are peasantry, you know, ditch diggers and, and muck farmers and, and whatever. So she, she's a little bit of a princess here. You know, since we're back in Mesotopia for this adventure, she's a half elf. Uh, she's probably from Aslandia, which is where the High Elves live, as, uh, as kind of the, the conquering racial majority over, uh, over the gnomes who used to live there. Uh, so this is, this is kind of, uh, King's, this is up King's Alley here. Bonds, number three. Her bond is, nothing is more important than the other members of my family. No, that's fine, Raven. Hopefully everything is all fixed. How have things been in your neck of uh, Ohio? And Dark Wolf goes back to the void. Norton had a thought. Norton would like art of Norton delivering the juice to the Awu. Do you want me to try drawing something, Norton? Could be a great question on what defines family as a character arc. Oh yeah, yeah, to explore as a concept, right? You you think well, but you know I have a mom and a dad. Well, what if our next character is an urchin and an orphan? You know, in your concept of family, there is, you know, just the people who won't stab you when you're sleeping or rob you. Good, uh, good concept, Eric. Raven says, good. Friends got up here and all. Just got done streaming editing. Life's been better. I'm, I'm glad. And you know, Raven, if you're streaming and you want to share that, you can pop over to the uh, to the Discord here. And uh, if you come over to dun, 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 uh, Twitch promotions here, uh, you're welcome to put a link up when you're streaming. You know, so Ivalon uh, was streaming Made RPG earlier. Plague Doctor was playing some uh, Destiny 2, and uh, prior to that, Ivlon was playing some Heart of Crown. 
Um, Tin Cat was uh, was even uh, putting up a link on behalf of someone playing uh, Conan, which is fine. Look, you, friends are your friends. Dark Wolf was inviting people um, on uh, or yesterday to watch uh, Dark and Dicey with her, and uh, it, it's good to see uh, Filthy Jester was uh, was commenting on that as well. So and uh, and Dark Wolf has a, a friend that streams, uh, so go from there. Super colliders, hi super colliders. I got, I saw that you had this up too. Unfortunately, when you all were uh, were uh, posting some of this stuff, like here at uh, super colliders, I wanted to watch, but uh, this was going to be getting close to uh, this was getting close to my game prep time for Mage. But when you guys post here, I I at least personally try to pop in at least for a little bit to say hi if I can. Uh, I can't always, but. Look, if you're taking the time to be a part of the community, I want to revisit you as well. Uh, well, Norton, that's going to be up to her. Uh, I, I can't control her, and I, I don't commission her. Uh, she she is a rogue artist. If something is inspiring to her, um, or I guess if you bat your eyelashes and go, pretty please, uh, maybe she'd be willing to drop something like that, but... Uh, any drawings that she or Eltrion or uh, Derek or um, uh, Nanev or any of the other uh, contributors do, they do at their own inspiration. So in, unless you're requesting me, I, I guess I could try uh, drawing that scene. Um, I don't mind taking requests, but I can't promise uh, the, you know brilliant art. Um, but yeah, I you can go around and see. <clears throat> Derek says, how do you know who your friends are? Call them at 3.30 a.m., ask them to get the truck, a carpet, and a shovel in a panicked voice. You'll know who your friends are. Don't forget a bag of lime, too. Uh, Super Colliders, no worries. Oh, thank you. Dark and Dicey was pretty good. Unfortunately, they aren't going to play next week. Oh. Super Collider says, uh, so where am I going to retrieve my Wu Lady's soul so our juice box legion can continue to grow? Um... Role play through it, man. It's uh, the, the, you you got this. Your ingenuity will be the thing that uh, that saves her. Now you can always try drawing from the deck of many things because a wish can reveal the location. So if you want to do an exclamation point deck, you can do so. Wags tail and hops up. No, no to me drawing. Okay. Norton and Ola, I would suggest at least offer some kind of payment, even if it is buying them a coffee. <laughs> Del Corin, hey Del, it's good to see you. What kind of coffee for the Awu? Awu likes coffee. Oh, the super colliders. <laughs> hey, there you go. Derek is uh, Derek's getting into it. And now super colliders is chaotic evil. Mostly passion inspiration based. I'd uh, like to set up a commission donation over the summer. Yeah, there you go, Derek. If you're in, a, if you're super in a pinch, Norton, uh, I I can try it. But it, you've seen their work, and well, I I've put one piece of art up in the character art, um, so it'd be interesting. All right, and her flaw, by the way, is number six. By my words and actions, I often bring shame to my family. So her family's very important, and and she carries herself in such like a hellfire and brimstone way. Like, you you don't speak that way of my family, and oh, puh, uh, puh. and uh, and perhaps in so doing, um, or maybe she's a little bit duplicitous. Uh, I mean, what if, what if she, what if she carries herself as a, you know, as a proper lady in some regards, uh, you know, so by day in court, you know, in, in the courts, in the markets, in, uh, in her house, uh, she does this, but maybe at night in order to kind of break out of her stuffy corset, uh, she loosens it up a little bit and probably goes into the taverns and, 
you know, engages in some body behavior. And she thinks that she's being all sneaky, uh, but maybe she's not. And so her family has heard of her, her alternative behaviors. And, um, <clears throat> um, and so it's bringing shame or it could be the, you know, it could be something where by my words and actions, if she has half elf, uh, parents, right? Well, I mean, if she has elven parents, like pure blood, high elf parents, but she's a half elf, well, obviously something happened somewhere. And so, you know, even though she's fiercely loyal to her family, it was, um, it was actually, you know, she's kind of a, a thorn in their side or their paw, uh, simply because she exists. Yes, she has elven blood. Yes, she's a part of the family, but her existence, you know, her trying to carry herself as an elf in an elven court, despite her especially favoring human side. Um, that could also be a, a method of discovery uh, for this character. Zerby is asking, how do I finish my character sheet? Well, that depends on what you're considering uh, finish to be. I did include some notes on the second page uh, for you, Zerby. And so all you should have to do in order to fill in any of those boxes is click inside the box. You see where it's blue and you click in here and then you know you can fill in words. You could go through and do that. Romantic, hello, good morning to you. His hyena side is too hyper. Oh, so even just whiffing some coffee right now might send Noel into just chasing his tail around. <laughs> Uh, so Super Colliders is now Chaotic Evil, burns the nearest tavern to the ground, and flies off. Um, yeah, alright, throws another fireball at the village. <laughs> King says, we'll get you started on our monthly customer service program, a free fireball every two orphanages you burn down. Super Colliders asks, uh, do you have dental? I'm cool being a lich at some point, but gotta keep those teeth clean. And uh, then proceeds to throw a fireball at orphans. <laughs> And now Norton's running around. We're under attack. Help. Think of the children. Chewy, hello. Welcome. You came at a very in interesting time, Chewy. Uh, there may or may not have been some draws from the deck of many things that have shifted people's alignments 180 degrees. So a lot of our normally good people are now running around as like chaotic evil and burning down orphanages. Chewie says, as a lich, you just knock them teeth out and put in gems. <laughs> Bubonic asks, what do I think of paladins who intend to go Oathbreaker from the beginning? I think it's possible. Right? I mean, look, you, you get certain spells and whatnot. Um, you know, if, you, if you're a, a follower of a deity that is empowering you to cast spells and have these abilities... You break your oath. Technically, you should lose that. You should lose that as a, um, you know, access to those divine gifts. Instead, Oathbreaker gives you just different gifts, which means that you've probably pledged yourself to some kind of an uh, evil deity. And if that's the case, then I don't see why you couldn't just be Oathbreaker. So instead of an Oathbreaker you would actually be like a blackguard or um, an anti-paladin or something along those lines. You've trained specifically to be a death knight or something along those lines. I think I said that twice. Demi Lich has one hell of a grill. <laughs> Romantic exits Kittypendia or Kidpendia to defend the innocent and uphold justice. And you know what, Romantic, unfortunately, it's one of your own. Uh, you, as you're seeing super colliders here just going nuts on the town, you know, look, he used to be one of you until he drew from the deck of many things. So hopefully you can do something to overcome this, um, this shift that has occurred due to this uh, very, very fickle artifact. 
Norton, this means I lost my connection to Yinogu. Well, um, the so in this case, Norton, you know, we're talking about anti-paladins or blackguards. You kind of are doing the reverse. So instead of being an oathbreaker paladin from the start, you've actually gone into a different kind of an oath. Um, so that being said, I suppose it would it would depend on what kind of a you know would you want to go into like a war domain, or would you even want to go and and improve your knowledge? You want to be a knowledge? Well, I mean, so that that's cleric. But, uh, you know, you have three different uh, oaths. Well, in the player's handbook, anyway, there's more oaths than that. As an example. So, I guess a cleric would be like a death cleric, but instead you pick up light or knowledge or something. Romantic pulls from the deck of many things. Oh, the skull. So, the next tomb, exclamation point, random tomb, that you vanquish romantic, uh, if you if you beat it, then you'll get double EXP. I agree, Bubonic. Yeah, I, I think you can go that route. Obviously, in a game, it's something to talk to your DM and fellow PCs about. Alright, so we've discussed a little bit about her as a character, and then she's a, a knowledge cleric. I, I think she, in my mind's eye, she is much more of the noble. And I do think that position of privilege is going to work with her. Um, she wants to go where she's going to go. She she believes that she has this authority one way or the other. And uh, so this position of privilege may open doors, but these are doors that are opened begrudgingly. <clears throat> Oh, uh, Romantic, <laughs> it looks like Chewy just beat you to it. So Romantic, you'll have to wait uh, one minute, and then you'll be able to go back into the tomb since Chewy just beat you to it. And uh, and uh, our maids in the background need time to reset the dungeon for you. <laughs> so uh no uh, chewy just uh it's exclamation point 1d20 You got a 16, so uh, Chewie ends up beating the Flaming Skull and gets a reward. And Romantic, uh, after you think a minute has passed, you can go into the tomb next because uh, Shizuka, Rhapsody, Unaleska, and Nyren are, are resetting the dungeon for you. So get, uh, get, get Chewie some EXP stat. All right, now that we have discovered the background, we are going to go into her race and find out what she gets by virtue of being a half-elf. Her charisma is going to increase by two, so I'm going to put a two here as a placeholder. And something else is going to increase by one. That's probably going to be wisdom. Um, we'll see. Right? You're a cleric. You cast off wisdom. We have our alignment. We have our size. Our speed is 30 feet, giving us a 15 climb and a 15 swim and a zero fly. We do have dark vision to 60 feet. We do have fey ancestry, which is going to give us advantage on saving throws against being charmed, and magic can't put us to sleep. So I'm going to put here verse charmed under advantages. And I'm going to put Fey Ancestry as a placeholder under racial features. We are also going to have skill versatility. You gain proficiency in two skills of your choice. I'm going to just write that down here. Two skills from a half-elf. And we'll think of something. Languages, you can speak, read, and write common, elvish, and one extra language of your choice. 
There we go. Bada boom. We got it done. Yeah. We did it. And now classes. Let's go down to cleric. We're fifth level, so we're only going to worry about these uh, little stripies up here. Two hellish languages, Abyssal and Infernal. So one's the languages of demons, the other's the language of devils, broadly. Norton's getting into the roleplay mood here, pops his head out of a crate, I think it's gone, ears down. Oh, what's this, a card. Uh, Norton the Knoll, you have summoned a skull. Norton, tomb, T-O-M-B, tomb. If you defeat the tomb, you have overcome this avatar of death as well. You'll get double EXP, and maybe maybe that'll help embolden your spirit, Norton. Uh, romantic day, don't... Well, you'll have to wait a minute now because Norton's going through the tomb... But after another minute, our maids will have the uh, will have the tomb reset for you. So romantic, don't forget, go through a random tomb here in a minute. Centipede swarm appears. You attack with advantage seven and eight. Uh, oh, eight plus five, and uh, Norton is uh, Norton is covered in centipedes. Oh, if not romantic, uh, then the magic will fade. Someone can grant you, someone can gift you some EXP. Uh, romantic. Uh, you can earn some by watching and by, um, well, you've already followed, but, uh, a subscription or bits. And also, uh, at the, at part three, right? So we're going to make this character. We're, we're going to finish up soon, actually make character two. And then when we enter part three, I give everyone 40 EXP for, um, for getting through the uh, the broadcast. Yeah, Chewy, I don't see So Chewy, hang on. I'll I'll grant you the EXP here. It doesn't look like uh, it's been given to you yet. Super Colliders takes on a Lulf Priestess. And, uh, oh, Super Colliders takes her down for uh, 1,500 EXP. Uh, so, is Ivalon or Dark Wolf, are either of you on uh, EXP watch? Mola asks, what do you do with these characters that you make? I, I hang on to them. Uh, I can put them up on Discord if they inspire you. Um, they they just they exist in this region that we're making together. So if I run a campaign, I might be able to pull on them as NPCs you can meet along the way. Nice, Norton. Look at that.
Uh, super colliders, I'll take care of your, uh, I'll take care of your EXP. There you go. Yeah, nice. No problem, Super. All right, as a cleric, we are a D8 hit die class. In fact, we are hanging on to five of those, conveniently because we are level five. Hit dice represent your ability to heal naturally, or you know, kind of get a second wind, catch your breath between battles, so you don't have to use up magic to heal. We do get light and medium armor proficiency, as well as shields. We are also going to get simple weapon proficiency. No tools. Wisdom and charisma are our saving throw proficiencies. So we're going to be better at those than the others. And we're going to get to choose two skills from history. Insight, medicine, persuasion, and religion. Well, Noble has, um, has taken care of two of those, history and persuasion. So religion, insight, and medicine. Uh, she probably doesn't have much insight given her, um, given her haughty nature, which would mean that, uh, religion and medicine, uh, she was probably sent off to a nunnery or something like that for a little while. Now, now she's out and wants to live the world. Uh, she, she was put away in, in like, in finishing school and, uh, <laughs> to try not to embarrass people. Medicine and religion. Here we go. You start with the following equipment. Uh, I guess we can choose two also because we're a half-elf. What would she end up taking, huh? And eh, let's wait and see what knowledge is going to give her. A mace or a warhammer of proficient. So we'll give her a nice old bonkin' stick here, a mace. Scale mail, leather armor, or chain mail if proficient. Um... I don't know. We'll just put uh, scale slash leather just for now. A light crossbow and 20 bolts or any simple weapon. LCB or any simple. As a placeholder, a priest pack. Oh, she's definitely going to take the priest pack. If she's a bit of an embarrassment, maybe she's uh, not performing her duties correctly or she's performing them very well. And is uh, evangelizing a little bit harder than maybe what the, the social situation calls for. And a shield and a holy symbol. So we're going to indicate she has a shield up here by filling in this little, uh, this little box. So we're going to add two to whatever her armor class is. And a holy symbol. We're going to get some spell casting. That is all well and good, but we're not going to worry about that yet. We're going to wait until after we have stats to really worry about the spell casting ability. We are going to get a, uh, a divine domain at level one, and we are going to go knowledge. Blessings of knowledge. At first level, you learn two languages of your choice. So now we're going to go up here and go dun 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 and dun dun dun. Heh, so she doesn't need a translator, she is one. You also become proficient in your choice of two of the following skills arcana, history, nature, or religion. Your proficiency bonus is doubled for any ability check you make that uses either of those skills. So we have history and religion, so we're going to go arcana and nature. And we can get uh, proficiencies doubled, so we become um, we become experts. We get expertise effectively. So probably history and religion are based on her personality. That seems to really be what she'd be an expert in. We are then going to get. Well, technically, the channel divinity is up here. So 
Super Colliders asks, are you smart enough to breathe still? I'm smart enough I could lose a few points. <laughs> Robert, how many players are there? Uh, so what we're doing here, Robert, is uh, exercises in character building and coming up with uh, creative ideas for running a campaign as a DM or a character as a PC. So what you're seeing in chat over here, well, there's a lot of different chatters who are role-playing and participating, and you are welcome to just hop in and have fun role-playing with them. What you're seeing on screen up here is a completely randomly generated character. We are leaving ourselves open to the, the winds of, of change and chaos. We're pulling her from the ethereal mists and manifesting her as a believable uh, three-dimensional character that we are then going to uh, make a party of five of such characters. And at the end of the week, we're going to run them through a campaign or, um, you know, like a, an outline, um, a concept of a campaign so that if you're following along, Robert, you can take ideas or even add your own if you will have experience as a player or a DM. Whether you've played for a week, a year, a, you know, two months or whatever, you're welcome to come along this journey and help influence the decisions whoop, for the character over here. You can ask questions along the way. Um, we, we'll end up making a map. We'll end up... Um, We'll end up making a map, we'll end up making a dungeon. We're gonna do a lot of fun stuff together as every week we plan and go through an entire adventure from the perspective of player characters and of dungeon masters. Uh, so Robert, I hope that answers your question. And if you have others, um, you can ask them. This is an open community. Derek says, have you come up with a theme that might be interlocking these characters yet? Well, I only have the one character for the week right now, Derek, so I have I have a, a theme for the campaign, but one that's interlocking the characters, uh, I we, we're only finishing number one right now. Oh, wow, okay, yeah, you started playing in 82? Uh, there are others who've been uh, long-time players in here, Robert. So I don't know if Bubonic One is still around. Uh, who, who else have been some? Uh, who else have been some uh, some long-time players? I've only been doing it since. Uh, well, I've been playing since 2000. Um, I've been running it for about 12 or 13 years. Yep, there's Bubonic. <clears throat> Such a rare beast. A rare but very magnificent beast, Derek. The longest and purest of beards. House of Dread, thank you very much for uh, following along on the journey. Hmm. We are going to get knowledge of the ages. You can channel divinity, tap into divine well knowledge as an action. You can choose one skill or tool for ten minutes. You have proficiency with a chosen skill or tool. Which, by the way, if you have the spell fabricate, this this uh, this channel divinity, it's not broken. But uh, for, for 10 minutes of proficiency, now, can you make a bridge as an engineer? Well, I mean, 10 minutes at a time, I guess, depending on how many times you cast it. But uh, if you need something in a pinch, it's there. Um, or if you need to work on, and you're, you're not proficient in blacksmith tools, well, you want to work on a project on the sideline, 10 minutes at a time, you can, you can get this proficiency with blacksmith tools and pound something out, quite literally. All right, we're not quite at Channel Divinity Read Thoughts. That's at level six. Uh, but she will get... Uh, domain... There we go. 
command identify augury and suggestion there we go and let's go back up here we get our divine domain and this is going to be a um, our channel divinity it's it's going to become um, Uh, not just well we're gonna have destroy undead at level five so I guess we could we could just call it that because normally this would be turn undead but now that we're level five it's destroy undead at fifth level there we go bubonic's been doing it since 78 yep Tycho scowls, don't touch my steak. <laughs> uh, yes, Robert. Uh, this is a cleric of the knowledge domain. Rykon, hello. Well, uh, so Rykon, I'm, I'm catching you up as I'm answering uh, Robert's question here. We have randomly generated a female half-elf who favors her human side, uh, either biologically with her looks or her personality. Who is a cleric of the knowledge domain, level five. She has the noble background, and uh, with with that comes her position of privilege. So she can get into places that maybe she wouldn't be able to otherwise. Uh, so in prior editions, Robert, you would serve a god directly, and that and that god had a portfolio of um, of different domains, right? Um, and and so you you look at. Um, You'd look at Vecna, you know, secrets and undeath, and and so these are all, these are all domains inside of his portfolio. In fifth edition, instead of presenting different gods to be aligned to, they are presenting different domains, and then they're saying, well, here are some example gods that may belong to this particular domain. That way, it's a little bit more open ended, and if you want to play in a homebrew. Or if you want to uh, take the 5th edition rules into Dragonlance, Forgotten Realms, or whatever, it's easier to just say, okay, I'm playing a knowledge cleric, and who is the knowledge, you know, uh, who is the knowledge god in this realm? And then apply it kind of retroactively. Uh, Rykon, yes, so every week is a new party and a new campaign that we plan. <clears throat> Pardon me. Would I allow the Oathbreaker to use Necrotic instead of Radiant? Um, doesn't it already... Doesn't it already do that? If not, I mean, yeah, that's it, it's it would seem thematic. Oathbreaker replaces the features specific to Sacred Oath. Uh, maybe for things like uh, like smites or something, but yeah, I mean, if it's thematic, damage types in Fifth Edition don't really matter. If something says fire and you want it to be. Well, let's say you have a fireball and you want it to be, I don't know, a poison ball. If you can make that pitch to your character, or to your DM, that your character uh, would have poison ball instead because of where he grew up, and maybe he actually doesn't like fire, so you don't take fire spells, or if you do, then it, they become poison spells instead or something like that. Damage typing isn't as important to be 100% you know, true, and not true good. But uh, true too in this edition, if you're telling a story and you're able to make it work. It's a fire, fire, fire. Green flame says Delcorin. Super Colliders flies off to burn down squirrel orphanages. <laughs> oh, that's a neat little emote, Norton. What is that? 
Some kind of a chat emote. Weird. Yeah, you know, if they're thematic and they make sense, or, it, you know, if you don't want it to be necrotic, you you could still attack with radiant energy. Um, you know, just because you serve an, ev an evil deity doesn't mean that you, you've stopped being able to deal radiant damage, because radiant damage is not positive energy. Radiant damage isn't good energy. Radiant damage is just that. It's it it is soup. It's like divine damage, and uh, evil deities can still have divine damage. Just like uh, necrotic, uh, necrotic damage isn't evil, necessarily. So just be careful you don't get caught up in that uh, in that type of uh, you know kind of black and white thinking bubonic. Um, you can still deal radiant damage even as a bad paladin. Because you're still serving a, a deity of some kind. And Robert, if you continue to have any questions about what you're seeing or what we're doing, um, ask them. It's, I'll, I'll happily answer, and others in here may also answer. Um, and even if you get other or different answers, well, you'll have a, you'll have a buffet of them from which you can choose. <clears throat> okay, well, we have we have our things here. Da -da -da -da. For level five, we're not really going to worry about this stuff. Let's see. If you do me an injury, I will crush you, ruin your name, and salt your fields forever. My favor once lost is lost forever. Respect is due. Nothing is more important than the members of my family. She's a bit of an embarrassment, though. So I'm thinking we could give her intimidation, right? If she wants to, oh, you listen to me. You know, I may look like a princess and be a princess, but I ain't no princess, princess. And maybe... Maybe animal handling, right? She's a noble. She should know how to how to ride and tame a horse. Or if she thinks that she's some kind of a noble or a princess, whether or not she is, um, or again, she might be a half uh, a half elf born into an elven family. If you get what I'm saying, but they may have taught her how to uh, you know uh, how to ride a horse, uh, you know, calm one if it's in trouble, or if you want to be the Disney princess and have birds and squirrels land on you and sing with you. Animal handling will cover that. <laughs> Don't princess me, princess. <laughs> well, excuse me, princess. <laughs> Robert, you think deception would be better? Sure. Uh, uh, make the pitch. Uh, where would uh, where would deception come in? And I'm not putting you on on, on the spot because like my ego is injured. No, th these this is our character. This isn't uh, mine. Uh, where where would you see a character with this type of a personality uh, be using deception? So here's uh, here's her personality. This is completely strange as an oath breaker get aura of protection and or aura of hate. So that's that's at seventh level, right? Now, by the way, this does say that um, the paladin replaces the features specific to his or her sacred oath with oath breaker features. So you would still get the paladin aura of protection. You are you, an oathbreaker. Still has the baseline paladin chassis. You're just customizing it, the oath aspect of the paladin with oathbreaker, and that's why you can still deal radiant damage as an oathbreaker. Yeah, because think about it, bubonic. If you're this leader and you're protecting people, 
Well, even if it's an undead army that you're marching into combat, you're still providing them buffs. You're still providing fiends or undead or even just other, I don't know, other, you know, characters that you're marching into combat with protection. Just because you're evil doesn't mean you can't protect your troops or you can't employ strategy. Uh, so let's see, Robert thought that, uh, oh, she probably isn't that physically large. You mean 5'3 uh, and 128? Well, if, if you think that it would be more appropriate for her to have deception instead of intimidation, Robert? Um, <laughs> maybe. She could be... Th this, is, this is a character you can conceptualize her in your head however you'd like, Robert. But sure, we'll, we can move uh, intimidation over to... Um, over to... Uh, or Yeah, from intimidation to deception. You're going to my town? I don't have a town, though, Tycho. I'm I'm just uh I'm I'm a wanderer through these lands. All right, now that we have our placeholders from our uh, our race, our class and all this, now we can start giving her stats and watching as the math spills over into everything else. You get a standard array. Well, this is one option, but uh the option I suggest, you get a standard array of ability scores. And we're going to put these into our six different abilities. Uh, Wisdom is our primary casting. We probably want to go a 15 there. She's also showing herself to be very charismatic, but also very intelligent. Uh, so I almost want to think maybe our 14 should be an intelligence. So there's our 15 and our 14. We can put our 13 into, um, Charisma. Our 12 in Con. 10 in Dexterity. And 8 in Strength. Now, you, you may think, well, that sounds, that sounds kind of weird. I mean, she's given a mace and all that. Doesn't mean she can't swing the mace. Doesn't mean, but that this could mean though that yes, she graduated from her seminary school, uh, and and she you know is given these uh, this training and these abilities. Doesn't mean she's the best with it or that she's an especially strong character. You know, we may often think of clerics as you know frontline beaters who get to wear armor and be kind of paladins. Um, that doesn't always have to be the case. You know, here uh, with this kind of a concept. We have a very social, almost like a wizardly cleric instead. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, and uh, Robert, we've made characters that have had uh, Constitution be their dump stat. We made a bard that had a 10 charisma. Um, because of the, the theme and the flavor and the personality, these things really spiced the character and made him come alive. She would move people through. Uh, she would move people to her will through her, through her will. Rogue Infinity, hello. I had to highlight your name there because it's uh, it was shown up as uh, white on white for me, Rogue. But hello to you, welcome. I am the Tom Bombadil of the Morgs verse. <sighs> King, if only I had magnificent yellow boots. Oh, if only. Derek says, I got kicked out of a game because I didn't know what I was doing because my cleric had a 12 in wisdom. Oh, my goodness. My good golly gracious. 
Really, Derek? That is, uh, blah. If you're not min-maxing stats, you're not playing. <laughs> and, uh, and you know what, Robert? That, that does work, too, because look. Look at her flaw. By her words and actions, she often brings shame to, the, uh, to her family. She could be, you know, caught in lies or things like that. You know, she's trying her best. But uh, she's not exactly winning the Game of Thrones, if you get what I'm saying. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, I love it. You like it. You love it. You need it. <laughs> Look at that. Those are pretty much Tom Bombadil's boots. I mean, because really, if you th they're almost like just big yellow uh, galoshes. So you do D and D based stuff more around the channel, uh, or wait, you do D and D based stuff? Or yes. Uh, so Rogue, what we do here every week, we make up five completely random characters in order to challenge ourselves and our concepts and, and build story and storyline. We'll do other activities like make a map and MS Paint. We'll make a dungeon, and at the end of the week, we'll bring the party together and then we will discuss the outlines of a campaign. So that you can participate, you can learn, you can contribute. If you want to take ideas and run them at your tabletop, you're welcome to do so. Um, and uh, and yeah, th it's uh, this channel is focused more on the development of your role playing skills, of learning D and D. Um, not just D and D. We talk about White Wolf games, you know, World of Darkness. We talk about heck. Uh, Ivalon over here uh, runs uh, Made RPG um, on his channel, so it's role playing in general, more specifically through D and D Fifth Edition. But we do a lot of concept work, a lot of tutorials, how tos. You can ask questions along the way, or you can participate as much as you want, Rogue. And uh, and that's that's even including if you want to role play and have fun over here. You can do that in chat and not just have to worry about what's happening above my uh, bowler hat. So if you have any questions at all, Rogue, whether you're a first timer, a newcomer to D&D, ask anything you want. Or if you've been playing for 30 years or whatever, uh, whatever your level of experience as a PC or a DM or with other systems, you know, Eclipse Phase, Lamentations of the Flame Princess, um, you know, uh, Golden Sky Stories, All Flesh Must Be Eaten all of this you can ask questions and not just myself you're gonna find a look if, if we were to measure up the experience of everyone over here in chat i'm sure we would have well over a hundred years worth of dming and or uh and or pcing uh you know playing as, as player characters together in this chat so you may actually get several answers for you to consider Oh, Norton is uh, Norton is directing me to character art. Aha, there we go. So this is the uh, lawful good Norton the Knoll. Uh, he pulled a card from the deck of many things, and being a Knoll, he's normally chaotic evil. But he did pull the uh, the card from the deck of many things, and uh, he is now a lawful good, very helpful Knoll who is giving the lunch back, uh, the lunch box back to Dark Wolf, who is our resident Awu. And, um, <laughs> so there you go. Oh, yes, and some some of you do have specializations to, uh, to Soapbox on. Oh, it's so cute. You love it. And OMG says Ivalon here. I will, I will reciprocate the, uh, the reactions. <laughs> very nice. That, that was very nice of you, uh, Dark Wolf. And, uh, Norton, it's good to see you've turned over a new leaf. Hopefully, though... Uh, you're in a bit of a moral quandary because Yinogu doesn't exactly cater to your new interests and lifestyle, but I'm sure you'll find someone who does. <clears throat> okay, so if there's no objections to this uh, spread of stats... Well, congratulations, she's earned a name, and she's not just a pile of numbers anymore. Ta-da! 
right? Nice little bit of symbolism there. And her wisdom goes to 16. And her charisma goes to 15. We erase our racial modifiers here. I'm not going to add in the numbers just yet because we need to choose a feat for her also. And a feat can have the ability to um, add a another uh, point to a score. So let's go over to chapter 6 real quick and check out what, uh, what feats are available to us. Rogue says, I've been recently DMing for about a year and a half, so I was going around Twitch to see if I could still pick up things. Oh, it, it, Rogue, it is a lifelong journey. And however much we can help you get through writer's block, or if you have a that guy at your table uh, and you need help in a social situation, not just with presenting a campaign, if you need help with maps or math or planning encounters or story writing, um, yep, Ivalon, steal everything from everywhere, be unrepentant. But, you know, make it make it yours and, and smooth, you know, use a little bit of plot putty to fill in the gaps and smooth it over. Um, but, uh, you, you know, Derek has a lot of, as he was indicating, uh, Macabre Derek has a lot of specialization. If you want to run horror elements in your game, uh, uh, thank you for the follow, Rogue. If you want to run horror elements in your game, I would talk to Derek. I mean, not that I, I can give you horror as well, but uh, Derek is... He has developed a very good attitude and methodology to presenting horror in a game. And it's not just about putting a bunch of skeletons on a battle map and, and fighting them. Because that, that can be horrific. It can have horror elements. But if you want to build suspense, for example... Um, her alignment, Robert, is neutral good. Macabre Peace Theater. <laughs> uh, as a bookkeeper, well, uh, Norton, uh, are you wishing to align yourself with, uh, the forces of, of, uh, the, the kitty pen here? Or are you looking for a job, uh, with the true good family? Are you looking to uh, start up your own sort of uh, null accounting business? Yeah, there you go, Derek. <laughs> uh, Robert, thank you very much for the follow also. Uh, let's see. So uh, with what Robert was saying, he's seeing her as a little bit of a schemer, um, as someone who isn't afraid of using deception in order to manipulate people. If that's the case, then maybe actor could be a good feat for her. You increase your charisma score by one. You have advantage on deception and performance checks when trying to pass yourself off as a different person. You can mimic the speech of another person or the sound made by other creatures. You must have heard the person speaking or heard the creature make the sound for at least one minute. Um, a successful wisdom insight versus your charisma deception allows for the listener to determine that the effect is faked. So maybe she uh, tries putting on wigs and makeup or whatever and she tries to sound like other people. Uh, that could very well be. I think an actor could fit her very well. As well, I think that um, an inspiring leader, you can spend 10 minutes inspiring your companions, shoring up the resolve to fight. When you do so, choose up to six friendly creatures, which can include yourself, within 30 feet of you who can see or hear you and understand you. And look, she can speak uh, six languages. Each creature can gain temporary hit points equal to your level plus your charisma modifier. A creature can't gain temporary hit points from this feat again until it has finished a short or a long rest. If we really wanted to, we could go uh, linguist. Um, you've studied uh, you've studied languages and codes. We can increase our int by one. We'll learn three more languages, including a personal cipher. Right? So if we want to be deceptive, we can pass notes back and forth in class that, that has her own secret code written on them.
Robert, you're thinking an actor would be better? I don't mind going that way. Uh, something else that we could consider as well is observant. Quick to notice details of your environment, you gain the following benefits. Increase your int or whiz by one. If you can see a creature's mouth while it is speaking a language you understand, you can interpret what it's saying by reading its lips. And you have a plus five bonus to your wisdom, your passive perception, and passive investigation. Um, aside from that... Uh, she's not really going to get into... She's not meant to be a, uh, a frontliner. So I don't think Warcaster would necessarily be appropriate. Unless we also want to give her skilled. You gain proficiency in any combination of three skills or tools of your choice. Oh, Norton is back to uh, Chaotic Evil. <laughs> Okay, we'll go uh, we'll go actor Robert. Okay, we're going to increase our charisma by 1, so that's going to put her up to a 16. And We'll get the other benefits here. So I'm keeping Actor as a placeholder, but I'm not going to write out everything what all of this means because it's going to take up a lot of room. They're placeholders, and if you have a question on what any of it does mean, Robert, or anyone else out there, you can ask, and I'll happily go back and explain. Well, what is what's Destroy Undead? That means her strength. We're going to give her a minus one, zero Dex, one Con. 2 Int, 3 Wisdom, 3 Charisma. Now with these numbers, and uh, by the way, let's go back to our Cleric here. At level 5, our Proficiency bonus is a 3. So, a Strength Saving Throw, well look, we're just going to copy and paste this minus 1. Saving Throw in Athletics. Dexterity, the zero is just going to transfer over. We have no dex proficiencies. Constitution is a one. Now we're going to start seeing where the, the proficiency bonus comes into play. Our int saving throw is two, and our investigation is two. Our arcana is going to be five, and our nature is going to be five. Now religion and history, here I'll zoom in a little bit. You see we have a secondary dot filled in for these two. It means she's getting double proficiency because she has uh, something, well, it's not called expertise di directly, but she has a, a concept called expertise where you add your proficiency bonus twice. And she got that because she is a uh, knowledge cleric. So she chooses two different uh, s studies to be very good at. That means that her religion is going to be six plus two, so that's eight. And history is also going to be 8. Now our wisdom saving throw would normally be 3, but as you can see it's filled in, so we get our proficiency. So we have uh, 6 to that, 6 animal handling, and 6 medicine, with 3 insight, perception, and survival. And we're going to do the same thing here, intimidation performance is 3, saving throw, deception, persuasion is 6. Uh, with her not being the most dexterous, she's probably going to take that scale armor. Now, if she's going to bonk someone with her ceremonial mace, uh, she is proficient with the weapon. So she does get uh, a plus three, but her strength is minus one. So to hit with her mace, she's swinging at a plus two. And her damage is going to be a 1d6 minus one bludgeoning damage. Um, if we give her a light crossbow as some ranged backup, 
she'll at least uh, have a plus three to try and hit, which is going to deal 1d... ooh... 1d8 for a light crossbow. Light crossbow, yes, 1d8 piercing. Plus zero piercing. There we go. Okay, now let's head back and we're going to fill in some more numbers. Initiative is a dexterity, uh, not a saving throw, uh, it's a dexterity check. So her dexterity modifier is bada boom up here. So she gets a plus zero. Her armor class, well, scale mail starts at uh, 16. Or, uh, wait, no. Scale mail, I think, might be a, a tad bit more. Should have kept uh, five up here. Might be a little bit less. Because it's only medium armor. Scale mail is 14 plus dex, which, uh, but it does offer a maximum two. So she's actually going to have a 14... But, comma, but, you can see that she's wielding a shield because we filled in the little shield icon down here. Shields add plus 2 AC, so she's actually going to be up to a 16 if she has her shield out. There we go. Now, at level 5... We're going to know 4 cantrips. So one, two, three, four. Cantrips are unlimited use spells. Well, it's not so much Thacko anymore, Robert. Um, instead of to hit, uh, in order to hit armor class zero, this is now if I'm attacking this character and I'm using a goblin with a bow and arrow, like a short bow, I would uh, roll a d20 and I would add my two hit modifier. And so now I need to hit or exceed her armor class rating. Uh, with her in scale mail wielding a shield, that means, uh, I don't know, let's say that my goblin has plus two dex and ha has a plus one proficiency. So it's, it's uh, shooting at a plus three total. That means that I need a 13 or higher on my d20 in order to hit this character's armor class with my short bow. It's kind of the same thing, but different, Robert. Um, you know, this came about in the revision uh, in, uh, in third edition to try and make things a little bit easier to conceptualize. So now most everything is roll 20, add the appropriate modifier, and check if you meet or exceed the, um, the, uh, the number that you're aiming for. Our spell slots, we have four first, three second, and two third. And we've used zero here. On this sheet again, you know, if you don't fill in something here, like, because you don't have fourth or fifth level slots yet, you can leave them blank, put in X's, whatever's going to make the most sense for you. Eltrion, hey, good old character building, magic in full effect. Yep, we're finishing up our uh, knowledge, uh, Cleric. Super, you're tired than usual tonight. Good night. I'm going to be evil and dream of burning more orphan squirrels. All right, Super Colliders. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> See you on our, on our Discord. Which, by the way, uh, for any of you newcomers here, if you want to join us offline as well, you're welcome to do so. All right, now, what does this mean for her spells? Don't worry about that. We'll, we'll get there in a second. Let's continue giving her things because now she she now has scores to support them. Uh, she can... Hmm. She cannot yet channel divinity. That's at next level. So we're going to call Chan divinity once per day. Now what's nice on this alternative sheet that we're using is over here, they do include a space for you to put in alternate whatever, like key points for monks, sorcery points for sorcerers. 
uh, your your lay on hands pool as a paladin. Um, how many uses of bardic inspiration or channel divinity? You can fill that in over here. Now for her spells, she is going to be uh, if she needs to roll an attack, uh, an attack roll for a spell. That is going to be her wisdom modifier because it is a wisdom based class for spell casting. So three, and she is proficient at spell casting. So her attack is going to be a plus six. Similar to how we calculated Mason like crossbow, but obviously she's better at casting spells than hitting people. Now the difficulty class, in order to resist or overcome the effects of her spells, are going to be your attack plus eight. So in this case, her spells have a DC 14 to them. And uh, if people need to save against them, and if she needs to try and hit someone with a spell, she rolls a d20 and adds 6 to the result. And then is looking to hit their armor class. Things like flat-footed AC, natural AC, all of that, um, that does not exist formally in 5th edition. Hit points. Clerics are a D8 hit die class, so at first level you get your maximum. At levels beyond first, I recommend doing the half plus one system. Instead of rolling the D8 every level, take half, so four, plus one is five. So she's a level five character, we've already given her her level one hit points. Therefore we have four times five, which is half plus one. Also, you get bonus hit points for every level. Therefore, so this is going to be five because she's a fifth level character. For every level, you get your con modifier in hit points as well. So if you look here, we have eight plus 20 plus five. So we have 25 plus eight is 33. Therefore, at level five, she has 33 hit points. Oh, Robert, uh, yes, it has been it has been simplified, yes. Most everything is going to be a d20 roll plus an appropriate modifier, depending on what you're trying to do. So we, we came up with all of these modifiers here in our skills based, uh, based on our, um, our ability modifier, which is going to be reflected most of the time in your saving throws and your skills. When it's different... It's because you are proficient in it, so you're better at it than other people. Um, so nature, she should have a two, like an investigation, but she's proficient in nature. So we're adding her proficiency bonus right up here. So two plus three is five. And where you're seeing uh, religion as an eight, not only does she have a two intelligence, not only then does she have a three proficiency, but you can see we filled in this dot next to it showing that she has an expertise in this field. So she can add twice proficiency. So we have six plus two is eight in that case. Uh, Coffee Cat, the simpler the better in my opinion. Uh, I do, I would tend to agree with that, Tricy. Passive perception. Oh, by the way, Robert, uh, this is going to be an interesting concept for you as well. I, I don't know if it existed uh, formally in the older editions, but you have something called passive perception. In this case, it's going it, to be 10 plus your perception modifier. So for her, it's 13. This is an excellent way to simplify a lot of searches. And you'll notice that spot, search, listen, taste, feel, etc. aren't split up. It's, it's perception. Passive perception is your natural awareness of what's going on. It's your peripheral vision. It's how good uh, your ears can pick up latent conversation or noises. Um, if I'm talking to you, Robert, and here we're making eye contact, I'm looking at my camera, I'm speaking, you know, there's my microphone over here, and, and you're hearing me, and I, I'm reading chat and all this. If someone were to come through my front door... I am perceptive enough that I would be able to hear my front door open despite not having to pay attention. In other words, I don't have to roll actively to do this. And wh where that comes in handy for you as a player and even for me or you as a DM 
if you have a character that has a high passive perception, you don't need to just... Um, oh, it was that way in second? Okay. I did not get to play first or second edition. So, um, in that case, hey, thank you for teaching me, Robert, because I certainly I, I don't know that much about the older editions. And even a lot of third edition is starting to slip out of the noggin. So, yeah, so there's a passive. So, if you're really good at it, you could walk around a room and not have to roll check, move five feet, check, move five feet, check. You're probably going to find something if you're perceptive enough. You don't have to have a lot of arbitrary dice rolls. Okay, we are almost finished. Uh, we do need to fill in spells here. And also, for any of you out there, uh, we need to think of a name. She has earned a name. What would we like to call her? She is a female half-elf. She does uh, tend to favor her human side, whether it's in personality or, you know, looks or something. Um, if we give her an entirely elven name, then, hey, maybe she was, well, I wouldn't say necessarily adopted, but maybe she was sired into the family uh, under various circumstances. Uh, maybe we give her an elven last name and a human first, or however you want to go about it. But think of some names that she has. We're going to learn four cantrips, and remember, cantrips are unlimited use spells. You know, they're low-level stuff, but you can use them an unlimited amount of times. Um, we have our spell slots, so yeah, let's go down to spellcasting. Spellcasting class is a cleric. We are going off of wisdom. Our attack bonus was six, and our save DC was 14. And this is, again, for, you know, key points, lay on hands, that kind of a thing. If we want, we can put in our uh, Divine Inspiration. Until next level, we can use it once per day. Four, three, two, for spell slots. Now... Clerics know every spell, right? You, you pray for miracles from, from your, your domain or from your deity. So you know, quote-unquote, every, every uh, cleric spell that you have. However, you can only prepare a certain amount of spells per day. And if we look down here... You prepare a list of cleric spells that are available to you to cast, choosing from the spe uh, cleric spell list. When you do so, choose a number of cleric spells equal to your wisdom modifier plus your cleric level. So our wisdom modifier is three, and our cleric level is five, so we can prepare eight spells. That said, our domain spells do not count against that eight, because this is our specialty. We are a servant of a divine, uh, of, a, of a knowledgeable uh, divinity. So we get our oath, or our, not our oath, we get our domain spells always available. But then we can take any eight in, uh, in the spell levels in which we can prepare, um, prepare spells. So if we want to go, uh, let's see, we have eight, so we could go uh, four and four. And we just say, nah, we don't need... Uh, we don't need third level spells. Okay. Um, you could go, um, you could go, um, two, two, and three. You could go, uh, five, two, and one if you want. You could switch it up uh, in between any time that you take a long rest and you pray for new spells. Uh, which by the way, I did forget, uh, she gets... At 5th level, she got two more domain uh, spells over here that she can cast in the 3rd level spell slot. And that is going to be non-detection and speak with dead. Cantrips. Now your cantrips are fixed. Uh, they're, they're unlimited use, but uh, y you got them. Robert wants Saffron for her first name? Sure. Eltrion, hello. Um, tell you what, Eltrion, why don't we kind of... Uh, yep, I was going to say, 
Uh, Robert Saffron Willowwind. Sure, let's do that. You you spoke what I was thinking. Five party. Uh, we, we generate five characters a week, Rykon. Completely randomly. And in fact, we're going to be generating our second one here after I take a little bit of a break. Um, I got to cool off my noggin because this hat's getting warm. And we've uh, we've effectively finished up this character. Now, we do need to choose her spells. But besides cantrips, uh, the eight other spells that she can prepare can be anything off of... Here, let me go to the list real quick. Can be anything off of the cleric spell list. Right, so here's cleric spells. Here's your cantrips. And then here's, you know, your first level, second, and third. And she can cast third level spells, right? And uh, in Robert, so again, it may have been different in uh, in prior, or maybe it's the same. Um, we You can know as a, let's see, even as a wizard, right? You could copy every spell in your book if you had the time and gold for it. Or here, as a cleric, you technically know every cleric spell there is. However, you can only prepare a certain amount, and wizards are the same way. You could have, you know, 300 spells in your spell book, but you can only memorize so many to use for the day. Now, what's what might be a little bit different is that further gets narrowed down into your spell slots. What that means is, um, if I have a... If I chose to uh, prepare four different spells in level one... I'm not relegated to cast each one of them once because I have four level one spell slots. If if uh, I take... Actually, look. If we look here at, uh, at first level, uh, here's Cure Wounds. So if I have Cure Wounds here, I can cast Cure Wounds four times at level one. And that just means that I can't cast my other level one spells. So really, it's preparing a list of options, and then you invoke those options that burn the resource of your slots. Now, in this edition also, many spells can be cast up. In other words, you can cast Cure Wounds at higher levels. So let's say that uh, you're getting beat on, Robert, and uh, and I'm, I'm blowing through my cures, right? I, I went through all four of my first level um, Cure Wounds. I can cast Cure Wounds as a level two spell. It will be more potent However, it will then also burn up my level uh, one of my level two slots. So even though I have maybe two different uh, level two spells, I can burn up uh, higher level spell slots by casting lower level spells up. Many, but not all spells give you that option. Well, yeah, so as, as Ivalon is saying, I can technically cast it nine times if I wanted to, to blow through everything. Yep, no problem, Rykon. And if you have any other questions on the format of what we do, you can always ask. Dr. Freakface, hello. By the way, uh, uh, and I'm sorry I missed you a little earlier. Thank you for uh, for participating in the one-word adventures that we have going, Dr. Freakface. Okay, so with that, we can go back and kind of mess around with her spells a little bit. I need to take a like a 10-minute break. I will be back. I will not have my hat on so I can cool off my noggin. And we are going to work on character number two. So if any of you came in like halfway and you're like, well, I get the gist, but how, are, how is he doing it? You can see from the ground up how we are creating characters here. Okay. So stick around and I will be back shortly. <laughs> 